May this be for the honor and glory of God. and all. Happy Sabbath. I wonder if there's anybody here in this room that is part of the Great Advent Movement. Anybody? Can I see your hands? If you're part of the Great Advent Movement, let me see your hands. Come on, be proud. Okay, good. Since you're part of the Great Advent Movement, I'm going to ask you to move. Would I ask everybody on this side to come on over this way? And some of you, if you care to come this way, just let's come together. Yeah, here we go. All right, thank you. Thank you. That's very motivational. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, now all the house lights just went out, so I can't see you at all. Is that... Can I have some house lights? There we go. Okay, people are reappearing. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Is that okay? You're not mad at me, are you? Okay, great. You're gracious, you're gracious as well. I appreciate that. I don't remember where I first, where I saw it, whether it was in a book, reading an article, or whether it was one of those signs, you know, those church signs, you see those clever sayings. But, but I do remember the saying because it really stuck with me. <clears throat> and it was something like this. It said, we don't believe in miracles. We don't believe in miracles. And then it went on to say, we depend on them. We depend on them. Do you depend on miracles? It got quiet. Do you depend on miracles? Do you believe that God is still in the business of doing miracles? Amen. If you were to, um, if we took a kind of a, a straw poll 
and asked which miracles, which of the miracles of Jesus do you believe were the most significant, what would you say? Any guesses? I mean, just what, what do you think? Wow, Lazarus being resurrected from the dead. You went, you went right to the core thing. The, what else? What other miracles would you not mind seeing? Feeding the 5,000, certainly that one, you know, is, is I expected that one to come. What else? Walking on water and? Was, was that an echo? Beautiful. By the way, Academy students, glad to see you. Praising the Lord that you're here. Okay, what about, you know, tax money, free tax money coming in? Remember Peter getting the, the tax money? That's pretty good. It's exciting. Could you imagine seeing a storm and seeing Jesus say, stop, and everything stops? Miracles are wonderful things, and I think you just admitted that it'd be a good thing not just to believe in miracles, but actually to depend on them. Well, this evening, I'd like to talk with you about what I consider to be one of the most, what would I call it? Um, I don't want to use the word powerful. You might expect that. One of the most significant and repeated miracles of Jesus. Are you with me? Are you interested? Okay. You know, <laughs> if I were to say to you, what about turning water into wine? What would you think about that? You think that'd be useful, interesting, important, valuable? I hope you will by the time we're through tonight. Please turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And we're going to read a couple of verses here. The account. John chapter 2. Miracles, water into wine. Anybody need water turned into wine? Let's see. John chapter 2. When you're there, say amen. 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 John chapter 2, starting with verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Where was the wedding? Cana, a little town called Cana. My wife and I have been there. Um, verse 2, now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Isn't that interesting? She didn't really have to say much. Just, Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your, excuse me, let's see, women, what does your concern have to do with me? They put it very nicely in this translation. My hour has not yet come. And then his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do, do it. Verse 6, now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons uh, apiece. And the ones that they showed us there when we went to supposedly the place where this took place were these stone jars. Yeah, very impressive, very interesting. And then it goes on, verse 7. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled him up to the brim. And then he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. Then the master of the feast, when the master of the feast had tasted the water that had been made into what? Into wine, but did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, hmm, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. Verse 11, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So this is the account, water into wine. And the Bible makes it clear that there is a setting in which 
the turning of water into wine is a very desirable miracle. No, the truth is, it's actually even deeper than that. There are times in life when it is a desperately needed miracle. When a feast runs out of wine, it's time for a miracle. Now, is there meaning in this story for you and me, teetotalers that we are? Is there some sense in which the turning of water into wine might be meaningful to us, perhaps even essential? I believe that it, this is most certainly true. Now, by the way, let me make a disclaimer right here. Uh, my understanding through studying the scriptures is that the wine that they were drinking here was grape juice, okay? Now, we're used to thinking of the word most people when they see wine, and the Bible translators were kind of limited because whether it's in Hebrew or Greek, there's only one word for wine or grape juice for both of those. In the Hebrew, it's, anybody remember? Yayin, yayin. And then in the Greek, it's? Oh, no, it's good. We've got good scholars here. Okay, one word means two things, either grape juice or fermented wine. And back in those days, they did not have refrigeration. They did not have anaerobic ways of making wine. So if you took grape juice and let it sit around for a while, in a very short time, you know, in a day or two it'd hang in there, but in a while it started getting very sweet, then a little bubbly, before you know it, it would spoil. And so what they would do is they would boil down, uh, after they had enjoyed the fresh, fresh stuff, they would boil down what was left into a thick paste, stored in clay jars in the ground, and then when they needed wine, or grape juice that is, they would dip that paste, put it in water, mix it, and they would now have reconstituted grape juice. Isn't that clever? Low tech, right? But it worked, okay? Now, all that to say that the idea of wine that you could drink like going to a store and getting a wine cooler, you know, and drinking this supposedly, you know, delicious drink did not exist in those days. It might, the, the, the grape juice might get up to about 4% alcohol I've studied this out very carefully. It might get up to 4% alcohol, which is half of the type of alcohol that a bottle of you know, wine would have, and then it would spoil. So you had to drink much wine. Have you seen that expression in the Bible? They drank much wine because that's all the, uh, you know, if they wanted to get a buzz, they had to drink much wine. Are you with me? In other words, this is not gallo wine. This is not heavy fermented wine. This is fresh wine that hopefully, and in fact, when they would bring out the best wine, what that meant is the freshest grape juice. That's really what that text meant. So scrap alcohol wine from, are we there together on that? Okay, let's get back into our story now. Okay? Now, please notice some interesting features about the miracle we're investigating. Look with me at verse 11. Did you notice what that said? This is the beginning of the what? Of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. And as a result of this miracle, turning water into wine. Now, yes, feeding 5,000 is on the schedule. Raising Lazarus the ultimate, it's on the agenda. But this, my friends, was the what? Was the beginning of his signs. And the, John is so bold as to say, look with me what it says there, he says, and he manifested his what? His glory. And his disciples believed in him. Water into wine, glory belief. Not something you would typically associate with this miracle, turning water into wine. I propose that this miracle is Jesus' signature miracle. In other words, not only is it his first miracle, but this miracle actually captures 
what all the other miracles would be about. About turning water into wine. About turning, many would come to Jesus for whom the wine of life had run out, you understand. And we can see him time and time again repeating the miracle of the wedding fist. Let me give you some examples. You have a notorious divorcee. She finds herself in Jesus' company by the Samaritan well, thirsting for acceptance and inner healing from her many mistakes. For her, my friends, the wine had run out. And then Jesus tells her, about living waters that are available to her and how his own divine love uh, and, and resources can restore the party in her life for he is capable of turning water into wine. A wealthy church elder meets Jesus at night hoping to satisfy his thirst for a real experience with God. You see, the wine had run out in his life. And so Nicodemus needs more than the waters of baptism or, or knowledge or information. Jesus offers him new birth. He offers to transform his dry religion into a vital, spirit-filled way of life. Jesus offered to turn water into wine. A sin-wracked party animal, yes, they existed in those days, is lowered from the rooftop of Simon's mother's house in the presence of Jesus by loyal friends. <laughs> His wine had obviously run out. And with the divine words, your sins are forgiven. The party is restored. And this man, this, this emaciated man comes alive. Water into wine. Are you getting the picture? Do you understand what we're saying here? What happened to a faltering prostitute when the sentence of God was passed? Neither do I condemn you. Go, sin no more. The bitter waters of her life were turned into sweet wine. And what about this, um, this guy that worked for the IRS? What was his name, Zacchaeus, right? Uh, you know, when Jesus suggested that they fellowship together over a meal, the brackish waters of Zacchaeus' soul were turned to fresh wine. Oh, my friends, Jesus was doing this miracle over and over and over in his experience. And what shall we say about those commandment-keeping, advent-expectant disciples on the road to Emmaus who were torn and disheartened because their Messiah seemed to turn out to be a great disappointment to them? Yeah, they were without wine until Jesus showed up, until he approached them, by the way, and opened their understanding concerning his great sacrifice, his, victor his death and his victorious resurrection. Their hearts did what? Burned within them. Burned within them as they walked along the road with Jesus. Water had been turned into wine. Amazing. And talk about water into wine. Talk about Pentecost. <laughs> they were not drunk with alcohol, alcoholic wine. They were drunk with the Holy Spirit of God. <sighs> the turning of water into wine at Cana was really not just a flashy introduction. It was Jesus' signature miracle. Jesus is all about turning water into wine. And so, how does this miracle take place in your life and mine? Well, let's take a look at one of Jesus' wedding parables. You know, we're on, we're on weddings, right? And so let's, let's look at something. If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter uh, 22. Matthew chapter 22. We'll see some connections. You know, we could have talked about the Matthew 25 where the, 
the 10 young, the 10 virgins, remember? They were also going to a wedding. Did something run out for them? You remember? Yeah, something ran out for them too, okay? But we're not gonna go there. Let's go to Matthew 22 and see some things about, uh, that might help us understand how Jesus can do this in our lives. Matthew 22, starting with verse one. <clears throat> And let me read for you. Please follow along in your Bibles uh, thoughtfully and prayerfully. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parable and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, but they were not willing to come. Boy, doesn't sound like a good story right from the start. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come, come to the wedding. Verse five, but they made light of it and went about their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. Verse seven, but when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burnt up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Verse nine, therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding, to the servant, to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all who were found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. In another telling, a different telling, one of the other gospels, when it tells the same story, it's more specific. Get the halt, the blind. Bring everybody and anybody. Bring them to the feast. Bring them to the wedding, okay? And then, of course, it goes on. It's interesting. So, verse 10, so those servants went, they gathered, the good and the bad, etc. Verse 11, uh, but when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a what? A wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but how many? But few are chosen. Uh, really, it's a gripping story, if you think about it. Uh, a lot of pathos, uh, challenges, good news, bad news. Let's look at this for a moment. We're asking, how is it that Jesus restores the wine in our lives? Let's notice something. In those first few verses, you'll notice that the guests were invited to the wedding of the king's son. That's good news, right? That's, that's great. But we're told then that the invited guests were what? Indifferent. They were indifferent to this all-important event. They were actually distracted by their own parties, by their own things that they were celebrating and enjoying, buying, selling, barbecuing, whatever, who knows. They were busy with their own joys, their own prospects. It's kind of like in the days of Noah, right? eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. And for 120 years, the warning had been sounding, flood coming, flood coming, flood coming, flood coming. But they were busy with their own parties. Thinking, my Lord delays is coming, let's enjoy life as it is. Thankfully, that's not the end of the story. The inv invitation is extended. But to whom? Everyone. To everyone. The invitation expended to everyone. Good, bad, halt, lame, blind. How do you think they felt 
when they were invited. Overjoyed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They were full of joy. Now, put that on hold. Let's look at something else, then we'll kind of put it all together. There was another person involved in this wedding, right? It was the guy who came in his tuxedo, or whatever it was, whatever he brought. And when he was, you know, stopped at the door, he was stopped because he was not wearing what? A wedding garment. In those days, the, especially if it was a king, some dignitary, they would supply wedding garments. Why? They would supply wedding garments so that everybody was dressed nice, okay? They made sure everybody, you know, was, looked great and classy. But when this guy came, it was obvious that he brought his own garment. And so there were, th what happened to this man? He was cast out as an imposter, as a party crasher, because it was obvious that he was coming on his own terms, not on the terms of the king. The king had extended the invitation to everybody, but this guy was kind of sneaking in on his own terms. By the way, you know, there was an article uh, just this week about a woman who was crashing weddings in Texas. Did you read about that? This woman, she was, they, they actually put it, you know, in the big news, um, and pictures of her and everything. She was actually going from one wedding to another in Texas, pretending to be a, a wedding guest, and then she'd kind of find a nice gift, and she'd kind of hang on to it like if she had brought it, and next thing you know, she's gone. Well, we don't know what this man's, you know, what his geese was, but we do know this. He was an intruder. He was a party breaker. He was coming in on his own terms, and who knows what he had in mind. And that's why he received a very severe treatment, because it was obvious he had not responded to the invitation. He had his own ulterior motives, his own, he brought his own wedding garment to this. So what do we have now? We have in this parable three types of guests. We have those that were invited, the chosen, the elect, but they were too busy enjoying their own parties. We have this guy at the end who shows up with his program and his who knows what, they, they caught him. He was a fake and they caught him and he ends up executed. It appears that the only guests who made it and partook of this stupendous gala event were the undeserving. Can you understand why they would be full of joy? Yeah. That's what it takes to have the joy of salvation restored in our life. Take off your rags, your wedding garment. Put aside your cheap excuses for not following Jesus and respond, undeserving as you are, to his grace and his love. Let's draw some conclusions from all this. Parting with sin will never satisfy. It will, it will always falter. You know, like a day at the fair. You ever spent a day at the fair? And, uh, you know, we make ourselves giddy and dizzy and sick with amusements, but the next day, it's headaches and heartaches. And when it comes to real life, there's hellfire at the end to take us out of our misery. Sin promises to add life to the party, but the truth is it steals the party of life. And so if you and I stay with our own agenda, 
We'll never have joy. We won't, it's temporary, it's cheap. It will not last. And some of us here can testify to that, amen? Partying with self-righteousness will also never satisfy. Smugness and self-absorption only leads to self-deception or insecurity, neither of which contain a drop of joy in them. And you know what? The wine of Babylon will not satisfy either. A form of Christianity that is high on emotion, satisfaction, and fitting in with the popular crowd, but low on sobriety and biblical truth and relational commitment to Christ will prove to be the most disappointing of all at Christ's return. You know, when the music is over, the experience is gone. That's not joy. That's not joy. Remember those in the parable that said, Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Did we not do all these wonderful, great things? Did we not have a great time, Lord, in your name? And he will say, I'm sorry, I didn't know you. You, you maybe were relating to a different God, but not to me. The permissive, intoxicating ways of the world are incompatible with the selfless love and absolute loyalty of those who are bound for the wedding feast of the Lamb. Only Jesus. My friends, if you don't remember anything else I said tonight, remember this. Only Jesus. Jesus in his fullness. Jesus as indwelling Savior and soon coming Lord. Jesus only can take the dull and difficult circumstances of our lives and turn water into wine. With his pardon, with his promises, with his presence, the Holy Spirit, with his paradise, which he will share with us. In closing, I want to share with you something interesting. Growing up in New York, and we do have a New Yorker here, right? Kevin, okay, super. Maybe others of you that, that have been in New York. Growing up in New York, you know, because of the immense amount of traffic that there is, most people use public transportation to go places, even when they're going to weddings, okay? And so what happens is, that if you're going to a wedding, most, most people really will have to dress up, and I don't know, Kevin, if you've seen this, maybe it's changed, you know, I was there a long time ago, but uh, you know, you, you essentially would get dressed up in your best, you know, your wedding best, and then you would get into the public transportation, the subway, the bus, the taxi, whatever the case may be, and you would travel to the wedding hall. Because even then, you know, the weddings were expensive, you had to be in, out of these places, right? So, you know, there wasn't changing and all that sort of thing. No, you got into your clothing at home, you got on the public transportation, and then you went to the wedding. I want you to imagine what that's like. You have all these people who are dressed, perhaps tuxedos, perhaps who knows, you know, very nicely dressed. <clears throat> Boutonnieres, it's obvious they're going where? To a wedding. And wherever they're going, whether it's getting on the bus, oh, let me stop at the 7-Eleven and get something. Uh, let me stop over at, you know, so-and-so's to get a gift. Wherever they go, everybody that sees them knows what? They're going to a wedding. Wouldn't that be nice if people could look at your life and mine and say, you know, I think that one's going to a wedding. <laughs> There's joy. There's a life commitment that shows they're going to the wedding of the Lamb. Would you, that, would you like that to be your experience? 
okay? Let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, you have told us that the joy of the Lord will be our strength. And that is a joy that we can experience whether we're in difficult times or whether we're in good times, whether things are going well or poorly. We can be dressed and people can notice because we have a soul commitment and that is to get to the wedding and to get there on time, to not miss it for the world. Oh Lord, tonight we want you to know that we are vessels, yes, full of water, willing, ready for you once again, day by day, to do the miracle that you do best, and that is turn water into wine. Thank you for being our Savior and Lord. In your name we pray, amen.